protocol established. Good night, comrades. I would like to ask you to turn to your right or your left and buckle your seat belts because we have a long ride ahead. I want to start by thanking the committee responsible for the 40th anniversary for this initiative of the restoration of memory. I have repeatedly said that historical amnesia is one of the most debilitating conditions that a people can suffer. Yeah, and it's no different from the affliction of Alzheimer's in a family. Your memory fades, then one only intermittently remembers and recognizes family and friends. And in the end, one does not recognize him or herself. And finally, all that's left is the vacuum. The American academic and cultural activist Henry Giroux speaks of the desert of organized forgetting, which is very applicable in the Grenada context. While we must accept responsibility for the collapse of the revolution, there is no question that it has been the victim of the most concerted campaign of organized forgetting by those who wish to obliterate this episode so rich with lessons for the future. <laughs> our willingness to confront our past, our unwillingness to confront our past, debilitates our ability to manage the present and to shape our future. We are reminded of the words of the Greek tragedian, Achilles, that, and I quote, he who suffer, he who lives must suffer. And even in our sleep, pain that cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart. And in our own despair against our will comes wisdom to us by the awful grace of God. In tonight's act of remembering, let us also pray for the wisdom that can come from the awful grace of God. Because Grenada has paid a heavy price in blood for the lessons from which this wisdom cometh. My presentation has several parts, five sections. I want to start by looking at the contemporary crisis of education in the Caribbean, why the Grenada experience matters, the context, the Geary inheritance, education in the revolution, and the revolution in education. To counter this organized forgetting, I would like to put some things in historical context. The first is a conclusion of a study conducted by Professor Patrick Emanuel, Grenadian, in 1986. And I note 1986, while both the trauma of the internal conflict and the aftermath effects of the US Psychops operation were still very raw. And that study was on political change and public opinion in Grenada. And its conclusions, 77.2% 77 of respondents indicated that the People's Revolutionary Government had always been popular, with 5.9% indicating it was never popular. The study also provides assessment on specific conditions under the PRG, which speaks volumes to the sophistication of the Grenadian masses. So all the greens are what people said improved. The intense greens were, you know, excellent improvement. The lighter greens, moderate improvements. I want to draw your attention to show you the sophistication of and, and why we need to respect the masses. Freedom of speech was the one thing that people said was worse. But how do you explain legal rights being improved 60.9%? So while on the one hand, people understood that the freedom of speech was curtailed, on the other hand, legal rights, the rights of women, of workers, significantly augmented by the revolution. The one statistic I want you to keep throughout tonight in the forefront of our exploration of the transformation of education is the lifespan of the revolution. 1,681 days. 
In fact, I'm writing my own personal reflections on it, and the title of the book is 1,681 Days. The revolution was born on March 13, 1979, and as far as some of us are concerned, it died on the 19th of October, 1983. And just to juxtapose, and a five-year electoral cycle in our normal Caribbean is 1,825 days. So as we undertake this journey, keep this statistic in mind. I want to turn to the crisis in education in the contemporary Caribbean. Let's take a quick look at it and use this to frame the exposition of the education transformation effort undertaken during the revolution. This, I hope, will better contextualize the quality of thinking and the intensity of action that characterized that effort. Education in the Caribbean generally followed the same historical trajectory from post-emancipation to post-independence. On this journey, there were some significant indicators of progress. And quickly, for example, every country nearly universal access to primary and secondary education, so a wider educated demographic. Average is years of education attainment moved from 4.6 years of average schooling in 1960 to 10.3. Significant expansion of tertiary, regional benchmarking of secondary exams. But there are some contemporary, our educational progress has been fettered by some uncritical adherence to the legacy of empire. There has been no critical and systemic deconstruction of this colonial inheritance, and a redefinition of education to serve a transformational socio-political agenda. Immutable paradigms prevail, and despite increased access, our education systems throughout the Caribbean remain fundamentally elitist. Our education, systems, our education systems are plagued with many problems that are all related to the legacy of this unquestioned colonial paradigm. So we have things like low access to early childhood, low school performance, imbalance in subject entries, and school graduates with inadequate skills. These are all things that we quarrel about constantly. But inequity in the system expresses itself in many ways. There's unequal provision, so resourcing differentials between private and public schools, rich and poor, male and female, urban and rural schools, the quality of staffing. There's the issue of socioeconomic status and the cultural impact education in, of education in the home. More educated parents, less educated parents, the impact of that on their kids. Nutritional status. And in today's world, the issue of the digital divide. A consequence of this is that failure has now become systemic. And nowhere is this more glaring than a 20-year analysis of CXC CSEC results that reveal that 22%, 66% sorry, of the cohort sitting exams attained between none and less than two subjects. Now, this is all candidates in a 20-year period sitting CXE exams. 12% obtained three to four subjects, and only 22% obtained five or more subjects, which is widely recognized to be the benchmark for decent wage employment. Now, when you see that statistic, there's something fundamentally wrong. It cannot be that teachers' inability to teach. It cannot be students' inability to learn. It is the fault of the system. Failure here is systemic. Elsewhere, I have argued that whereas in the post-emancipation period, education was the primary instrument of social emancipation, in the post-colonial, post-independence period, it has now become a central instrument of social stratification. And this perspective is substantiated by ECLAC, which pointed out in 2011, and I quote, that the region has failed to transform the education system into a powerful mechanism for equalizing opportunity. 
partially because a deciding factor in educational achievement and results is found in the environment and available income in the home. Advances made during the past decades in terms of coverage, access, and progression in the different cycles of education have brought about a stratification of learning outcomes and achievements in the education system. And this inequality is usually reflected in a clear segmentation and stratification of the quality and efficiency of the education provision system itself. So, is that clear enough? So, let's talk now about why the Grenada experience matters. It takes us to this question. It matters in essence because Grenada represents the most comprehensive and strategic effort in the shortest time, 1,681 days, in the post-independence history of the Caribbean to overhaul the education ecosystem. Not just the education system, the education ecosystem. It makes explicit what Paul Stern, Popwitz, and Tabashnik and them call the central influence of ideology and power in the attempt to alter values and structures. It illustrates the importance of context because it shows how central the discourse of education reform was to the rhetoric of the revolution and the legitimation of the transition state. It also elucidates the organic dynamic of how the idea, the vision, gives shape to the system that must be infused with content which requires processes and ways of doing consistent with that vision. You see the interconnectedness of it all. Context is everything. In all of this, the experience of the Grenadian Revolution was not new because over the ages, thinkers have always articulated lofty goals of education. From Martin Luther King, Plato, Socrates to John Dewey. Right? Martin Luther King talks about the function to teach one to think intensely and think critically. Uh, Pluto talked about the purpose of education, give to the body and to the soul all the beauty and the perfection of which they are capable. And this one, my favorite from Socrates, that education is not the filling of a vessel, but the lighting of a flame. So what makes Grenada matter is that it sought to actualize the assertion by Dewey that the conception of education as a social process and function has no definite meaning until we define the kind of society we have in mind. And that is what differentiates what happened in Grenada in the 1,681 days from other attempts in the Caribbean. So the context now, the Geary inheritance. As I now turn to the pre-revolutionary context, which has to be addressed in the early effort at education transformation, it will further reinforce why the Grenada experience matters. Grenada was the first OECS country to gain independence from Britain in 1974. And it did so in a context of unprecedented political instability and a demonstrated tendency to autocratic government which I didn't say, but was highlighted in the DEFAS report. And to avoid any suspicion of political selectivity in the, what I'm going to present to you here in this section, I will draw solely from international, external, and pre-revolutionary reports of the Ministry of Education itself. And here is the summative picture. On the economic front, a study by British Crown agents in 1972 depicts structural changes in the economy showing a decline in agriculture, the emergence of a small light manufacturing sector, and an uptick in tourism, while there were significant increases in the size of government bureaucracy between 1965 and 1970. It warned that while some jobs would be created in tourism, Prospects for significant increases in employment in other sectors were poor, 
and that the number of persons seeking full-time employment would increase to 10,000, while those seeking part-time employment would increase to 4,000. The Fernando Report of 1974, produced by UNESCO UNDP, identified a social pyramid representing extreme inequality that was also reproduced in the education sphere. It identified a large low-income group, quote, living in substandard rented houses, with the majority of their children not having the privilege of attending secondary school. A World Bank report study in 1979 assessed the education system as being ill-suited to the country's development needs with inappropriate and outdated curricula, dilapidated primary school plans, and shortage of educational material. Other specific indicators of the condition of education in pre-revolutionary Grenada included 86% of the adult population had received primary school education level, and 92% of them had passed no exam. 65% of common entrance scholarships had been awarded to relatively affluent families comprising less than 10% of the total population. The four junior secondary schools in the system were operating at 56% capacity, with only a 20% completion rate. Practically all preschool teachers had no formal training in that area. 60% of the primary school teachers were untrained. 21% of secondary school teachers were qualified. And the four secondary schools in St. George's had 58% of the graduate teachers, although they accounted for 37% of the 10,247 students. In 1979, 22 qualified and 57 unqualified teachers left the system. The teachers' college output was 29 teachers. It was estimated that given this rate of attrition, it would take the country 30 years to achieve full certification of teachers using the existing teachers' college model. And finally, student performance. In 1978, 968 students sat the school leaving exam, only 28 passed. The transition from primary to secondary school stood at between 10 to 14 percent. And for Cambridge O level exams, 87.6 percent of candidates received passes in zero to three subjects, while only 12.4 received passes in four or more subjects. These statistics provide adequate empirical adumbration of the condition of education inherited by the revolution of March 13th and the fundamental challenges that they pose to any modernization effort, far less a revolutionary project. Having described this context, I would like to talk about education in the revolution an exploration of the NGM critique of education in post-colonial Grenada and its prescriptions for its transformation, much of which was heavily influenced by the concepts of Ujamaa socialism espoused by President Nairi of Tanzania. <clears throat> the Pan-Africanist orientation of the NGM evolved rapidly as the revolution increasingly veered towards Marxist orthodoxy but the framework of education in the revolution remained culturally grounded. The conception of education in the revolution was derived from the NGM statement of principles, and you have a, a digital copy of that. Ten principles, principles which focus heavily on people empowerment and the right establishment of the right to employment, to social inclusion and participation, to health and decent standards of living, and the development of talent, ability, and culture. In its 1973 manifesto, the NGM identified those four explicit priorities for their education agenda. 
incorporating agriculture, fisheries, agro-industries, and tourism as curriculum subjects in the formal system, the establishment of free secondary education, the utilization of participatory approaches to textbook production, and the establishment of what they call freedom schools for adult education and skills training. All four of these priorities of intent, I call them, became pillars of education in the revolution. It is important to situate the effort and accomplishments again in that life cycle, the 1,681 days, because it can be asserted without any fear of contradiction that the inherited post-colonial construct more was accomplished in that transient historical episode than in any other preceding historical period in Grenada or the, widen, or the wider Caribbean with the possible exception of the post-colonial transformation of Trinidad and Tobago under Eric Williams. There is a fascinating study, my wife likes to hear that Eric Williams story. There is a fascinating study waiting to be done on educational transformation in post-colonial states, focusing on the challenges of access and equity. Why? Because you can expand access within an elitist configuration in which you open the tap wider to allow more persons to drink. But that itself does not guarantee the right of all to drink. Equity, however, is not possible without increasing access. There was a palpable air of possibility and optimism that was fueled by the youthfulness of the revolutionary protagonists. As Woodsworth put it, bliss it was in the dawn to be alive but to be young was very heaven. I miss my six pack. But Woodsworth was not there. Gazan, the Tambo Stewart, that's not what he looked like then, had the epistemic privilege of being there and young and expressed it thus. And Gavin said, the present is changing. A bright, a new and bright future is coming into being. Let us go to close the door on that which is old and dying away. Come, let us go to greet tomorrow and feel at home in this new day. Education in the Grenada Revolution was a primary arena of ideological contestation. More than any other sector, any change initiative in education explicitly, more than implicitly, articulates its philosophical underpinnings. As Dewey previously asserted, it is only when we define the type of society that we seek to create that education as a social process and function assumes meaning. The core question of education transformation is what is the purpose of education in society, its outcomes, who benefits, whose knowledge is of the most worth. These are quintessentially political questions that are ideologically grounded. At a superficial level, these questions appear to have been answered in the post-independence Caribbean. But the reality is that we have only tinkered with specific components of the system, but have never focused on the re-engineering of its elemental architecture. Maurice Bishop succinctly articulated the role of education in the revolution. He said the role of March, the revolution of March 13th brought into being a new dynamic in education because it had always been a fundamental tenet of our party that the right to education was an inalienable and necessary one. Every historical process which seeks to improve the condition of the working people must provide for their educational and cultural development. In Grenada, our most precious resources are our people, and the process of national development is not simply an economic one, but also a question of the liberation of the cultural energy of our people. And because the frontiers of human knowledge are forever expanding, because the horizons of the mind are ever widening, education should be a continuous process. At the first National Consultation on Education in 1980, Morris further outlined 
four main objectives of a revolutionary education system. First, it attempts to teach people greater critical appreciation of their own reality so they know how to change it. Secondly, to develop the innate abilities of the masses of the people and not just entrenching the privileges of a few. Thirdly, to develop the productive capacity of the society since it is only through expansion in production that the standard of living, including the education system, can be improved. And fourthly, it tries to promote the democratization of our society, the process by which people are encouraged to take an active part in the education system itself and in all major decisions that affect their lives. Now, just parenthetically, fast forward to the death of the revolution, one of the things I heard most frequently on the streets in that moment of crisis was people saying, all you bring CPE, all you bring education, you all bring participation. We have the right. Why is the party not consulting us now? We have the right. We were taught to think. And it reminds me of the admonition in a colonial document where some white colonialist was warning that it's very difficult, it is very um, dangerous to teach the Negroes to read and write. Because once they learn to do that, they will not stand easily in the old entrenchments of ignorance. The conception of education in the revolution was not a utilitarian one. It was not just about developing human capital for economic progress. You know, I hate to hear in, in our contemporary discourse, Everything is about skills development, developing the economy. We forget about the civilizing influence of education. Education was first of all defined in the revolution, first defined as a fundamental right of all. And it was considered to be a medium for cultivating consciousness, for shaping citizenship, for developing culture, and enabling empowerment. Another way of conceptualizing that conception is represented in this diagram. So you have education at the core, there's the citizen, the role of education is shaping the citizen, understanding, developing their innate human potential in, in all its dimensions. The ideal citizen, one who knows their rights, but you also know your obligations and your responsibilities. And you, know the, you understand the obligations of history. Because there are a lot of things happening in this Caribbean today. If we knew our history, we would think and act differently. Our political system, the political and historical awareness, the question of participation in that system, the economy, developing the productive capacity, and at the level of family and communities, balancing tradition and modernity, the social unleashing the social potential. Now it's interesting that in 1980, the Grenada population in Grenada was 110,000. The Grenada diaspora was 300,000. The earnings from exports in 1980 were 44 million. EC dollars, the remittances came to 41 million. That's why the PRG spoke about the visa mentality. The economy, the education system, the production system in Grenada from that statistic was not geared to develop Grenada. It was geared to export workers to other climates. That's why the visa mentality. So, every dimension of this broad conception of education carried implications for how education was to be delivered. Its modality, its structure, its methodology, its content, and its protagonists. If we examine the sphere of the economy, for example, we can see clearly how the conception of education and the revolution went way beyond the instrumentality of the school system to manifest itself as a process of knowledge, assimilation, and application, as a symbiosis of learning and doing, and of knowledge as a factor of production and an enabler 
of becoming. On the economic front, the revolution had an ambitious plan for modernization of the productive sectors of the economy. And remember, the pre-revolution was it 78 Kong, Kong um, agents report, right? What it said about the state of the Grenada economy. So the plan of the revolution required putting foundational infrastructure in place, for example, the international airport, moving beyond the export of primary products to greater value-added export, ensuring food security, a slogan was, grow what we eat, eat what we grow, and creating avenues for the widest economic participation. And the formation of cooperatives at the time was seen as an ideal vehicle for this. Undergirding all of this was an infrastructure of training, research, and development. And that diagram behind me, remember, 1,681 days. All of that infrastructure was put in place in that period. So starting with the training, research, and development, the revolution established a agro-industry multipurpose plant that was meant to start to put in place the infrastructure for value added going beyond primary production. And that linked right into the Mirabeau Agricultural School, which was training young people to become farmers. I know um, Chadel will be happy to, to hear about this. And Mirabeau Agricultural School was also linked into the Grenada State Farms. All the farms appropriated by Gary were pulled together in one state entity with the aim of making them productive enterprises, which also included profit sharing, by the way, for the farm workers and so on. But that linked also into the Marketing and National Import Board, which still exists today, to handle imports and also exports of produce, and the Agro-Industrial Factory, 42 jobs created with its establishment. The Agro-Industrial Factory in the first year uh, purchased 205,498 pounds of produce from farmers. It earned $286,000 in nectars, jams, hot sauce. We need a tin, canned, canned tamarind, mango, sour salt, Help me out there. All the gray haired people, well, you know it. Those were the days. Um, the forestry developed, the fish processing plant with 21 jobs was established. We never started producing its own salt fish. Uh, a forestry development corporation, 87 jobs created. Uh, in the first year, 35,000 cubic feet of timber produced. And through the MNIB, vegetable export increased from 27 by 27 percent between 80 and 81. Um, at the level of primary production, you had the Grenada State Farms feeding that value-added production. You had the Mount Hartman sheep and pig farm, the Kariaku sheep production, and you had the National Fisheries Corporation with six boats, ferro concrete trawlers donated by Cuba to facilitate um, serious fishing, not artisanal. And then the research thing was the Mardi Gras agronomy and soil, co soil conservation facility. Cardi had a field station and the National Cooperatives Development Agency. Um, Grenada did its first national farmers census and the first aerial survey of the agricultural sector. So here we have these specialized knowledge institutions utilize work study training approaches in modern but appropriate technologies. They undertook some extension work with private producers, sharing experiences, etc. And um, there you have it. They, here's the evidence of it. The farm schools in Mirabeau and La Sagesse. More land being allocated, $7.1 million for the fisheries project, the graduation of fisheries students, and our famous Grenadian saltfish. Not the sparrow kind. <laughs> so, in the broad 
conception of education in the revolution, the principle of education as a basic right of all and as a prerequisite for holistic national development meant creating a different dynamic of purpose and structure in the formal education system. And that is what is represented here. In all of our education systems in the Caribbean, there's a pyramidal structure. You start at the base with wider access. It becomes more selective. You know, you, you access is more restricted under the fiction of ensuring um, quality. So you have exams that determine your flow from one level to the next. Um, the, the two factors which created this dynamic was the requirement for education to develop people and build society, and a rapid paradigm shift from selected, selective to universal access at all levels. So on, the, on my right, that pyramid there is what the traditional system is like. We have very weak early childhood development, even up to today in the Caribbean. But we have broad primary, ed, almost universal primary education. Secondary education is still, uh, although we've moved to universal, but there's still a loss of demographics moving from primary to secondary. And at the apex of tertiary education, even less access. Whereas the revolutionary conception was to have universal access, meaning a free flow. Now, that is conceptually. Obviously, people may not necessarily choose to move from secondary, but the, the access, the guarantee of access is what matters here. And you'll notice with those triangles, what we showed is integral to the conception of education in the revolution was that mix of, of um, the technical and vocational and the academic with parity of esteem. So at, in the early childhood sphere, it's about developing the cognitive ability, but a lot of emphasis on play, on motor development, etc. At primary education, work study, project application, the, fun, the, foundational, the foundational academics. And so it went up the chain. So having described the amplitude of the conception and the application of education in the construct of the revolution, I now want to turn to the revolution or the nature of the transformation in education itself. So the distinction I made in the title, education in the revolution, is how education in its broadest conception, not as a school system, but education as a development of the human mind, capacity, and competence was applied in the revolution across all sectors, economy, life in community, everything. But the revolution in education now, we are going to focus on the drastic changes made in the methodology of education itself. So, to illustrate the nature of the revolution in education, I want to explore seven major initiatives which together paint an adequate picture of the extent of the paradigm shift in education that substantiate my early arguments about why the Grenada experience matters. And these six initiatives are the process of popular engagement on the transformation of education, the literacy campaign and the CPE, the National In-Service Teacher Education Program, the Community School Day Program, curriculum and the creation of indigenous texts, the democratization of schools, and other measures relating to poverty impact mitigation and learning enhancements. In general conceptual terms, the transformation of education in that period focused on three elements, the teacher, the curriculum, and the learner. Not the student, the learner. The focus on the teacher placed emphasis on the professionalization of the teacher with mass upgrading of primary school teachers through NISTEP, as well as specialized training for early childhood teachers and other levels of teachers, the involvement of teachers in the development of new curricular and core subject areas, and the shaping of a new pedagogy of engagement. The transformation of the curriculum centers around the challenge of content and the age-old question, whose knowledge is of the most worth? The 1973 NGM manifesto promise of using participatory approaches to textbook production speaks to the engagement of teachers in the definition of content and the production of knowledge. 
We will see later how this was actualized in the teacher development initiatives of the revolution. So the process of popular engagement. Between July and September 79, the PRG convened a series of consultations involving broad social and sectoral representation, educators, private sector, trade unions, churches, etc. Twelve sectors were represented by 77 delegates and 16 institutions or organizations submitted written reports and memoranda. Four basic questions were presented to focus the dialogue. And the questions are what kind of individual should the education system produce? Who should control the schools? What kind of school system should there be? And what should be taught and how? Virtually all of the organizations represented agreed on the need for some program of education change. The weaknesses and failings of the system were too self-evident. Following the first phase of the seminar, Submissions were sub circulated to schools and participating organizations for comment. The feedback from schools was synthesized into a consensus of views, which formed the basis for discussion and debate during the second phase of, of the seminar one month later. George Brizan, in a study, reported that 67 schools and organizations contributed to the consensus document and that this document represented, to quote him, a most comprehensive view of the thinking, criticisms, concerns, and recommendations of those most closely associated with education, unquote. The consensus was particularly strong in three areas, teacher training, curriculum reform, and adult education. In the area of teacher training, it was felt that teachers should receive professional training, that the experience of qualified teachers should be utilized in the process, and that teachers receiving training should be bonded. The consensus over curriculum reform centered around the need for relevance, relating education to the world of work, and the need to standardize approaches in particular subject areas. And in adult education, the call was for the establishment of a national literacy and continuing education program. This is what created the impetus necessary to fire the public imagination about the changes in education. And importantly, it liberated the initiative of teachers at all levels. Following the consultations with teachers, which by the way was attended by Paulo Freire, a famous Latin American educator, a survey was conducted and 76% of the teachers who attended indicated that on their own initiative, they began to implement ideas coming from the workshop. The innovations introduced by the teachers fell into six major categories. Cooperative activity involving institution and revitalization of house systems, 4-H clubs, Red Cross savings unions, class SUSU, student councils, and increased group work in and out of the classroom. Productive activity a renewed vigor in school fundraising activities and expression of self-reliance by schools. It was reported, for example, that many schools have started or expanded tuck shops with students in charge of food preparation, selling, and accounting. Notice what's happening on the teacher's initiative in the schools. One school has been able to purchase a deep freeze, which pays for itself out of the proceeds of snow ice sales. Thirdly, creative and artistic activity. Increased activity in arts and craft, drama, music, and singing, with more attention given to indigenous folk arts. Self-help activities mainly reflected in the involvement of teachers, students, and members of the community in continuing school beautification and repair efforts. In social studies, the content and objectives of the teaching of this subject reflected the orientations at the seminar and involved things like field trips to historic sites and development projects, and democracy in the school, sharing school and classroom responsibilities with students in order to develop a greater sense of responsibility and inculcate democratic values. In the Grenadian historical process, as in many other revolutions, a fundamental tension existed between democratization and centralization. The events of October 1983 were a tragic resolution of the contradiction between the centralizing 
authoritarian tendencies inherent in the NGM's characterization of itself as a Marxist-Leninist vanguard on the one hand, and the democratizing impulses created by the removal of the Gary dictatorship and the assertion of the people's jurisdiction within the transition state. The energy and enthusiasm generated by the engagement of everyone, not just educators, in the shaping of the education transformation agenda was a testament to the viability of that approach. We now turn to the literacy campaign and the Centers for Popular Education. This was the first major program of the revolution. And in, in announcing the, the campaign, Prime Minister Bishop indicated that the CPE is a critically important program because through the CPE, education, which was previously a privilege of our minority, will now be the right of all of our people. The launch was preceded by a parallel track undertaken. On the one hand, extensive and intensive public sensitization and mobilization that included panel discussions in literally every village in Grenada, Kariakou, and P.T. Martinique. I can say without challenge that in that time, I traveled every road and track in the full length of Grenada, Kariakou, but not P.T. Martinique. I never got to go to P.T. Martinique. Um, yeah, and these, these discussions were on the importance of literacy to personal empowerment, community advancement, and national discussions. And they involve the most senior figures of the revolution with some of us from the technical side. So Maurice Bishop, Bernard Cohen, members of cabinet, the NGM Political Bureau, alongside prominent educators. Meetings were held with all mass organizations, all religious authorities, the unions, the private sector, and the Grenadian Union of Teachers played, played a prominent role in this thrust. Massive billboards were erected in all parishes with slogans, never too old to learn, education a right, not a privilege, and the country was plastered with 30,000 CPE posters. A comic book illustrating the importance of literacy was produced by a local artist, Gordon Hamilton, and literal house-to-house -house visits, literal house-to-house -house visits uh, countrywide, especially in areas of poverty concentration, to bring the message of the campaign to every home. The leadership team comprised Valerie Connor and myself as joint coordinators with a Cuban advisor, Angel, we fondly call him Abuelo Arechea. On the other parallel track was the technical planning involving the structuring of the campaign and the preparation of all the instructional materials required. The campaign was structured, and this is my, my old notebooks from those days, the campaign was structured from the village level up with dual components. The mobilization side was coordinated by village mobilization coordinators. And on the other hand, technical coordinators responsible for overseeing the teaching process and providing technical support to the volunteer teachers. The only paid persons were the campaign staff at the national level. Members of the National Technical Commission, Yulan Sonny who's there, was a member of that commission parish coordinators, technical, and mobilization. Over 3,000 youth and students, members of the public, teachers, committed voluntary time to help in any way possible, from teaching illiterate neighbors to organizing cultural events, sporting activities, village community work, all aimed at building a sense of solidarity and caring. An icon of the literacy campaign was the youngest volunteer, 11-year-old Lyndon Adams of Leicester Kariakou, who taught his grandmother to read and write. The instructional material developed for the campaign reinforced the ethos of national pride and revolutionary effort. The 14 themes of the literacy reader, Let Us Learn Together, adequately summed up what the revolution was seeking to achieve. So here were the lessons, the 14 lessons. Let us learn from each other. We build our communities. We need a Kariakou and P.T. Martinique. I'm talking about them as one because these two appendages of the past were now part of the, the state. So P.T. all didn't recognize that in the referendum. 
<laughs> um, the land must produce more. One Caribbean. Free milk for mothers and babies. The revolution brings more doctors. Our international airport. NCB, the bank of the people. I think that's what you read now, Richard. <laughs> um, being in a group, we need a vigilance in our villages. Our history of struggle. Education is a must. And lastly, the revolution has room for all of us. The literacy campaign was a fire sweeping the spirit of the Grenada people. Initial and then regular training and evaluation sessions were held at the parish level. We produced our own newsletter to keep everyone informed of developments and the progress of the campaign. Emulation ceremonies were held every month to recognize learner achievement and teacher consistency. An unintended cons outcome of the campaign was the emergence of CPE cultural groups that led to a revitalization of the folk culture of Grenada, its songs, dances, and traditions, and a creative outpouring of poems, plays, and songs. So here's the Tivoli CPE cultural group and big drum dancers of Kariaku at an emulation ceremony. Uh, literacy award ceremony. At the midpoint of the campaign and at the end, successful leaders were given certificates of accomplishment at, certificates, at ceremonies presided over by the top leadership of the PRG. The campaign closed with a major rally, with a major rally, uh, having reached 130, 130 of 135 communities in Grenada, Kariaku, and P.T. Marknik. It touched over 8,000 learners and received the nomination of the International Council for Adult Education for the 1981 UNESCO Prize for Literacy. <laughs> the conception of the CPE was broader than the literacy campaign though. And it was the incarnation of the, of the NGM's promise of freedom schools. Well before the end of the campaign, work had commenced on the establishment of a parallel system of continuing education whose aim was to turn every school in Grenada by night into an adult education center and ensure a seamless articulation of education opportunity for all. CP to take you from wherever you are to wherever you want to go. The following chart sums up that configuration. So there were conceptually three phases. Phase one was the literacy campaign run by volunteers. The certification was the CPE literacy certificate. Year one, the program was, it was a one-year program, basic literacy, but strongly linked to cultural animation. And it happened at homes, in communities, anywhere and everywhere. The second phase, which after, which started after the, the literacy campaign ended, was done not by volunteers this time, but by paid trained teachers in the system who were given tax-free tax titans by government. And you saw earlier some of the certification. Uh, we actually designed these certificates, so they were formal certificates issued to people. Um, there were four levels of certification. Uh, that took you from CPE level 1 to 4. Level 4 was the equivalent of the school event certificate. And then at the time, CXC had the basic exam. So, so we'll take you right up to CXC basic. Once you achieve CXC basic, then that's where you can look back into your aspiration anywhere in the formal education system. Um, it was a three-year modular program. Again, for residual literacy, illiterate, so it did literacy, post-literacy at the four levels. And the subjects in the four levels were English language, mathematics, geography, natural science, and history. And uh, whereas the literacy campaign happened in homes, in community centers everywhere, the phase two of the CPE happened in schools island-wide. And then the third component of it, was, which is the continuing education, 
was where other stuff that I already described, like setting up these specialized institutions for training and development happened, um, and it was staffed by trained professionals. So a dedicated team of, and here you see the phase two centers, island-wide, including Karyaku and Piti Martinik. The dedicated team of Grenadian teachers worked diligently to prepare a consolidated set of four CPE textbooks. Unique to its time, it sought to integrate its themes. A reading passage on water in the English section, for example, would generally speak on the importance of water in our lives. But this was complemented by problems in the math section of the book dealing with water-related calculations. So, for example, a leaking pipe in Mount Morris losing three gallons an hour. How much is wasted in 24 hours? And then calculate the utilization of opportunity cost of that wastage. The water theme was continued in the geography section with sources of water in Grenada, importance of rivers, etc. And in the science section, on the science of water, its chemistry, its biological value, and its importance to life. In presenting these lessons, teachers were encouraged, and this is again a distinguishing thing. Teachers were encouraged to undertake real-life challenges, having, for example, having the class identify water wastage in their community. Go through your community, identify all wastage of water in the community. Invite and notify the water authority and arrange community labor to fix the leaks. The content of these consolidated texts were local, relevant, and applicable to the challenges of the historical moment in Grenada. So, for example, this is from a couple of the textbooks. Kunia was a humble, semi-literate worker who discovered a way of um, dealing with the a beetle that was affecting, um, I think it was Grenadian cocoa, um, using the, the wood of the African and, and the, the secretions of the African breadfruit. And we made a big thing out of it. CPE helped make Cunha famous because he was an inventor. And that is, you know, look at the paradigm shifts. An ordinary humble worker, a subject of a text in a book, speaking to his scientific prowess. He was no big-time scientists with PhDs, but observation, native intelligence, these are the things that we need to treasure and value and promote and cultivate. Besides Cunha's invention, one thing was on the international airport, which was a source of great national pride and mobilization. I think other than the CPE, the national, international airport was perhaps the thing that united all Grenadians across class boundaries, religious boundaries, everything. And um, boat building in Karyaku. So these were just samples. So I want to turn now to NISTEP. Teacher qualification has practically reached crisis proportions by 1979. Three major reports between 1973 and 1976 all explicitly call for a new approach and a model involving in-service teacher education. So you have the Fernando report, the Goodrich report, the Clough report. And the NISTEP objectives were to prepare teachers to seek the UE Qualified Teacher Certificate, to raise the level of competence of classroom teaching. Because remember at the time UE was still a benchmark for teacher certification to achieve the, increase the level of achievement of children, simultaneous to the training of the teachers, develop a common curriculum, build a stock of material appropriate to training of teachers, develop and raise the level and quality of pedagogy, and upgrade the status of teaching as a professional career. Started in October 1980, NISTEP involved 534 teacher trainees, about 260 teacher partners who were qualified teachers who served as in-school supervisors and advisors to their trainees. And it was run by a staff of 18 full-time and seven part-time tutors who were organized by subject panels. Classes were held two days a week at three central locations in Grenada and Karyaku, and teacher trainers were visited in school twice a week by tutors. In the first and second year, you see the subject that the three years, the subjects that were taught. 
um, as well as the preparation of a research study. In fact, the ministry even provided the NISTEP trainees with a list of research topics of interest to the ministry that could help us in, in obtaining empirical data for further planning. Um, <clears throat> there, is a tale, there is a tall tale to be told about the establishment of NISTEP and the institutional resistance of UWI Cave Hill to the paradigm shift that it represented, a classical case of the incapacity to recognize obsolescence. The university held hard to the idea of the teacher's college model in the face of all evidence refusing to bulge. Not only was NISTEP the most feasible way to address the deficit in teacher qualification, but its design also addressed the need to engage teachers as authors of curriculum, as producers of new knowledge. Additionally, the financial bottom line, the financial bottom line was inarguable. Whereas the teacher's college model trained 90 teachers at an average cost of 5,600 5, uh, EC dollars, NISTEP trained 318 at an average cost of 1,848 dollars. Further vindication of the program is found in the fact that when the first cohort of NISTEP trainees was ready to sit the UE practice exam, the entire faculty of the School of Education came to serve as examiners and insisted on adjudicating the work of the entire cohort because instead of the customary um, sample, NISTEP recorded 100% passes in that assessment. Besides this step, there were other smaller in-service initiatives. So they included 12 months upgrading program for 35 teachers who had been in the service for over 15, 20 years. They were over 40 years of age. So, you know, give them an opportunity to upgrade and retire at a different level. A specialized two-year program for, for 60 daycare and preschool attendants, which also included registration by 10 community persons who were interested on early childhood development. And associated with these were the minimum, the minimum um, entry requirements for the teaching profession at different levels. The establishment of a preschool healthcare program and the promulgation of preschool code of hygiene, certainly for the OECS unheard of in that time. Preschool was just child-minded. So we turn now to the community school day program. The challenge here is how do we keep schools open with hundreds of teachers out of school when you have a substantial number of teachers in training two days a week? How do you keep your schools in operation? How could we cater for approximately 24,000 affected students in 66 schools? Closing school for two days a week was not an option, and the PRG made that frightfully and abundantly clear to us. The only and feasible answer is to keep schools open and to find a way to make that learning open, flexible, and innovative. What if we invited parents and the community to teach, to mentor, and guide students in hands-on learning and doing? Thus emerge the CSDP, Community School Day Program. The Minister of Education, Jackie Kreff, threw out the challenge and defined the opportunity to students themselves. She said to them, this is your day to get to know your community. Go out to the factories, the historical sites, the beauty spots, the fishing beaches, the farms, the workshops, the agro-industrial plants. Learn from the people. Learn from the workers. Respect their skills, for it is upon their excellence and productivity that our society will grow and flourish. Five objectives were set for the CSDP. Introduce students to the world of work in a concrete way. Be a productive participant in the process of national development. Make the school the focal point of the community. Involve the community and the students in the development of the entire local. And to assist in the formulation of the new curriculum by Integral, integral links between school and community, 
experimenting with new ideas and experiences and demonstrating the validity of these new elements in the practice of the schools. Although faced with immense logistical difficulties initially, the result was an exciting infusion of culture, skills, and eclectic learning in schools. So in trades, you had often in conjunction to actual school repairs, students did apprenticeships in carpentry, masonry, plumbing, electrical wiring, and so on. You had visiting lecturers, visiting lecturers from parents, the private sector, community organizations, career guidance. Some old people in parts of Grenada came to teach Creole, which was an almost dead language in Grenada then. Indigenous dances, creative writing workshops with local poets, tradi learning traditional crafts, conducting cultural research, field trips, including getting involved in minor restoration work, work attachments, the cleaning up of school surroundings, community cleanups, beach cleanups, etc. So what was the outcome? <clears throat> CSDP's most in, more innovative activities included the organization of agricultural school gardens in 12 primary schools with funding from Oxfam Canada. A series of national exhibitions, including two exhibitions of student craft which traveled to Trinidad and Barbados. The sale of craft items produced by students through Grencraft, which was the craft outlet of the revolution, with the proceeds going towards the acquisition of material for the program. And importantly, gender neutrality to trades and, in, in, and innovative subjects. So girls learning carpentry, masonry, engaging in what was formerly seen as largely male um, activities. Let's turn quickly to the curriculum and the creation of indigenous texts. In its most <laughs> In its most generalized definition, the curriculum is a body of prescribed or official knowledge to be transmitted, engaged, interrogated in the education process. In any attempt at education transformation, the curriculum must be problematized. Questions need to be asked about who prescribes, what is prescribed, why is it being prescribed, and at the center of it is the age-old question, again, what or whose knowledge is the most is of the most worth. So, you, people talk about the, the explicit curriculum. There's the hidden curriculum. The hidden curriculum are things that unintended um, impacts of curriculum. In planning the curriculum development process, what again was different about Grenada is that we did not just look at laying out a formal curriculum, but looking at the the unintended effects of that curriculum, how it went down in the social and um, cultural context of the country, and how do you start to change student attitudes and the receipt of that curriculum, the manner in which the curriculum was received. So the general principles of that curriculum process were, were outlined. What should we teach? What should be the content? And how should we organize it? So a strong focus on the local, with broad awareness of the international environment, taking into account the national aspirations, Caribbean and national consciousness, whole person development, the how we should do it, participatory process, teachers, students, national development stakeholders, make sure we do suit the age and the stage, practical work, flexible, group and individual engagement. And then the guiding principles of that, of that um, curriculum was outlined. Now, here we had the process, how the process started. The curriculum development process was a carefully thought out but highly participatory one. Teachers speak, which was a compendium of ideas. We might spoke about a seminar, in, the first seminar in 1980 that brought all teachers together. This book, Teachers Speak, was produced from that with listed all the ideas that teachers generated. And that became part of the Bible for the curriculum development. Together with a survey that was conducted looking at asking teachers for their views on the new curriculum. The thinking that emerged from this was taken to parish level meetings 
with curriculum leaders in every parish and was also discussed on a national special radio program called Moving On. The systematic work was then commenced on the English language and the maths curriculum with the use of a children's page shown here in the Free West Indian to disseminate the evolving work. So it was a way of field testing the work, but also as a work in progress, sharing it, getting feedback, improving what was being done. Murray Hodge was one of the thought leaders and innovators in this process, and she explained the dynamic between the curriculum of subjects and the shaping of new subjectivity. So Murray said, the language arts program can be seen as an important means towards fostering the kind of democracy that Grenada has set itself as a goal. Now notice, everywhere else in the Caribbean, when we talk about language syllabus or curricula, we're talking about just the technical um, mechanics of the, of the language, learning English properly. But here in Grenada, we were talking about self-expression, the habit of discussion, the gathering of information through the printed word, the ability to analyze information and forms one's own opinion. These are some of the skills that are necessary for the exercise of democracy. She further explained that critical thinking was necessary to give meaning and purpose to education. And I quote Merle well again, one could place other areas of the curriculum in the same perspective. What ends are to be served by the subject called history? What ends are to be served by the subject called history? Will the subject called history continue to impress upon us how insignificant we are in the scheme of things? We have to do some serious thinking about what we in our part of the world mean by or mean to achieve by history, by geography, language arts, etc. We have to adjust not only content but also methods to the objectives that we set ourselves. Often it is how things are taught rather than what things are taught that will make a difference. For example, the use of group work and cooperation rather than individualistic competition, the practice of discussion, give and take between teacher and pupil, teacher and pupil pooling their knowledge and ideas rather than the teacher perpetually handing down information to passive students. An outcome of this process unfolding across the education system was the genesis of indigenous texts and publications. Which, and this is only a sample of what I, I have in my collection. Um, between CP, NISTEP, and the revolutionary publishing house Federal Books, a whole generation of literature evolved. Lastly, we come to the other measures. So, Let me just scan the landscape quickly because we had the international um, student councils, integral part of the governance of schools, but helping to students to learn accountability by assuming responsibility. This is a scene from International Students Day Rally. And um, I think this is Tali Francis, who was then president of the National Students Council. The other thing was the move away from the PTA parent-teacher association to the formation of community education councils. And that was a consequence of the CSDP program because with community members getting so involved in the schools, the school was no longer just the parents and the teachers. It was the community. So repositioning the school and bringing all of these actors to bear in that effort. The other measures relating to poverty and impact mitigation or school feeding programs in the schools a back-to-school campaign that was concerted and all over the country to ensure that every child was in school with penalties for parents keeping kids away from school. Um, you had access and equity measures. There was a progressive reduction of school fees. Remember the NGM promised free education. So from 1979, fees moved from, were reduced um, to $50 and then to full abolition in September 1981. Free universal secondary education. The junior secondary schools, which were a limbo land of nothing happening, were converted to full and proper secondaries, creating 800 spaces in secondary schools. Education reform as a dual access equity measure 
introducing standards of measurable learning. So, sorry, examination reform. So we formed the National Examination Board to properly reconfigure examinations. And one of the things, um, we never had fallen into the practice of total multiple choice exams. And in fact, the parents derisively described that as the shading thing. So we teach children to just shade bubbles. And here now we reintroduce the essay writing, um, reading, oral reading, and so on as part of the test. And then tertiary education access, the establishment of the Institute for Further Education. Um, that was the, the precursor to TAM CC, and incidentally, they're celebrating their, their 40th anniversary this year. I'm told that um, by Roberts that there's going to be a, a reunion, so all IFE people. Now, um, just as a side note, I remember sitting with Jackie Kreff and discussing where do we go with IFE? And the thinking there was that we need to locate a campus in St. David's, a huge campus, and we actually had discussions with the Soviets about totally financing a state-of-the-art um, higher education institute. As a compromise to their generosity, it was going to be named LIFE, the Lenin Institute of Further Education. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then an unprecedented scope of scholarships. Cuba, the GDR, the USSR, but also importantly, India, Canada, the US, the Commonwealth, areas like engineering, agronomy, economics, medicine, education, a whole range of areas. You can see in that time that um, tertiary education was practically free. I now want to end, oh, sorry, I'm not finished yet, daycare. Um, by 1981, the revolution had built seven pre-primary schools and one nursery and repaired 14 pre-primaries. Um, school repair program, in, this is a scene from Mount Morris. In the first two weeks of January 1980, the PRG sponsored a school repair program, the first major repair drive in 25 years. Five out of 62 schools were in good condition. Twelve were slated for demolition. The private sector donated material, paint, food, estimated at a million dollars. 4,000 plus volunteers of all ages worked weekends and after hours to clean, paint, repair, and renovate school compounds. The estimated value of community inputs, $2.3 million. New secondary schools were constructed in rural parishes with a very strong um, focus on equity to rural areas. In 1983, three new primary schools were opened in St. John, St. Mark's, and St. David's at a cost of 2.1 million. 40% of the school buildings in Grenada were built prior to 1930, with poor maintenance by state or denominational boards. The denominational boards owned 74% of the primary schools. The estimated cost of the needed reconstruction was 6.5 million. School furniture was equally acute with reaching crisis by 1982 because we needed 11,201 units. And when I say unit, I'm talking desk and chair as one unit. The PRG sourced 50,000 US from UNESCO and opened a line of $780,000 line of credit from Cuba for, to supply 37 primary schools, four secondaries, two junior secondaries, and 20 preschools with furniture. Weaknesses in science and um, technology learning, lab improvements in all secondary schools, and uh, late or early 1983, the negotiation of 14 teachers, science specialists from the Soviet Union with master's degrees in science to teach and uh, um, upgrade the caliber of science teaching in the secondary schools. So that was 1,681 days. Peter Drucker said the best way to predict the future is to create it. Where would we have gone beyond the 1,681 days? In a report by the Minister of Education, Jackie Kreff, to the Central Committee of the NGM in July 1982, we identified 14 strategic goals on a 20-year horizon. The first was the transformation of curriculum relevant to national development. 
accomplishment of universal secondary education, functional literacy for all up to O and A levels, institutionalization of political education in schools, continuous training for all teachers, universal pre-primary education, institutionalization of work study, institutionalization of community education councils, island-wide technical and vocational training. We had actually started setting up technical institutes in each um, quadrant of the country so that to be specialized institutions, schools would be bust in because we couldn't afford to have one in, in every parish. Island-wide um, national appreciation and application of science and technology, national testing, evaluation, and research system, centralized training through IFE to become life, full university, zoning of all schools, and full state control of education. Now, let me, let me just end. So this is the story, as I said, of the 1,681 days and nights of work in the arena of education. Regardless of one's ideological perspective, the most neutral questions that can be extracted from the Grenada experience is the simple lesson of the magnitude of the transformation that can be accomplished in a short period of time once you have decisive political will, a deep process of consultation that taps the public creative imagination, and the value of citizen, citizenship engagement for creating disruption, a competent technical apparatus energized by commitment of bringing results to the people, and a systems design perspective that sees the interconnectedness of things and optimizes this in shaping solutions. Now, in this presentation, I sought not only to describe education in the revolution, but also to explicate the nature of the revolution in education itself, how the process of education was fundamentally changed. This historical drama was not an even and smooth process. It was a fascinating kaleidoscope of shifting currents, finding consensus at key points, but at the same time, let's not be elude ourselves, it was an intensely contested arena of ideological struggle between distinct interest groups. There's a lot more that needs to be said on the nature of the contradiction in the processes of educational change. Because despite the virtual unanimity of opinion on the necessity of some of the most prominent educational initiatives of the revolution, there was considerable contradiction about the extent to which they achieved their objectives, about the approaches and the content that they embodied, about the ideological orientation that they displayed. These responses showed that people can hold simultaneously contradictory positions that confronted with so complex a subject, the reaction of different social actors can embody the contradictions of the process itself. So that in one interview I had, um, an opponent of the revolution expressed the view that given a choice over which programs to implement and which to scrap, he would have implemented all, but change their motives. <laughs> Don't know how you do that. To what extent can we realistically separate the educational programs of the revolution from its ideology? One of the emerging arguments is that first of all, the ideology of the Grenada Revolution was not contrary to what opponents of the revolution tried to make it a monolithic outlook. Within the revolution, you know, there was the party perspective with its Marxist-Leninist um, orientation, but there was also the participatory impulse that the party itself led in the communities. Um, the ideology of the transition state may have an identifiable orientation but it is essentially a worldview in search of itself. It is an evolving arena of consciousness in which the received dogma is interpolated by the pragmatic reality of the society in which it is being developed. Cultural constraints, the configuration of power, the weight and tempering force of tradition all conspire to shape the ideological outcome of the historical moment. Secondly, it is possible to trace within the dominant ideological trends 
which tendencies provide the impulse to creative action, and which ones fetter the emergence of imaginative responses to the dilemmas of transition. One certainty is that no educational reform is ideologically neutral. Even the blandest expression of nationalism in what Fuller calls the fragile state conceals an agenda of incorporation. The central issue in unmasking that agenda is to ask in whose interest is that agenda constituted, by whom and by what means. These questions point us to the dynamics of power in the transition state, but they also help in making sense of the multiple perspectives that contend with each other. Does it take a revolution to make a solution? Some have lamented the fact that there have been such strong negation of many of the positive aspects of the revolution and wondered aloud whether it takes revolution to achieve some of the things that the Grenada Revolution had accomplished. This was not necessarily so, but what is definitely needed is a strong organizing principle around which the national and social will can be mobilized. The Grenada Revolution unquestionably provided a strong social and political principle around which it sought to organize Grenadian society. In the sphere of education, the eradication of privilege by the broadening of access to education at all levels and the free provision of education are the significant and most memorable features of education under the PRG. Thank you.